Hello, and welcome to my show on civil rights. My name is Barbara Bullen, and I'm one of the radio hosts for the New Heights Show on Education and the New Heights Educational Group. I hope you enjoy the show, and I'm asking our listeners to consider becoming a sponsor. This show is pre-recorded. This show is based on the life of Frederick Douglass, who wrote three autobiographies. I will continue with a second autobiography written by Frederick Douglass, which is My Bondage and My Freedom, which each week I will read to you certain portions of each chapter. The ebook can be downloaded from www.guttenberg.org backslash files backslash 202 backslash 202 dash h backslash 202 dash h dot htm. Chapter 21, My Escape from Slavery. I will now make the kind reader acquainted with the closing incidents of my life as a slave, having already trenched upon the limit allotted to my life as a freeman. Before, however, proceeding with this narration, it is, perhaps, proper that, that I should frankly state in advance my intention to withhold a part of the connected with my escape from slavery. There are reasons for this suppression which I trust the reader will deem altogether valid. It may be easily conceived that a full and complete statement of all facts pertaining to the flight of a bondman might implicate and embarrass some who may have wittingly or unwittingly assisted him, and no one can wish me to involve any man or woman who has befriended me even in the liability of embarrassment or trouble. Keen is the scent of the slaveholder, like the fangs of the rattlesnake. His, ma his malice retains its poison long, and although it is now nearly seventeen years since I made my escape, it is well to be careful in dealing with the circumstances relating to it. Were I to give but a shadowy outline of the process adopted, with characteristic aptitude, the crafty and malicious among the slaveholders might possibly hit upon the track I pursued, and involve someone in suspicion which, in a slave state, is about as bad as positive evidence. The colored man, there, must not only shun evil, but shun the very appearance of evil, or be condemned as a criminal. A slaveholding community has a peculiar taste for ferreting out offences against the slave system. Justice there being more sensitive in its regard for the peculiar rights of the system than for any other interest or institution. By stringing together a train of events and circumstances, even if I were not very explicit, the means of escape might be ascertained, and, possibly, those means be rendered, thereafter no longer available to the liberty-seeking children of bondage I have left behind me. No anti-slavery man can wish me to do anything favoring such results, and no slaveholding reader has any right to expect the impartment of such information. While, therefore, it would afford me pleasure, perhaps would materially add to the interest of my story, were I at liberty to gratify a curiosity which I know to exist in the minds of many as to the manner of my escape. I must deprive myself of this pleasure, and the curious of the gratification where such a statement of facts would afford. I would allow myself to suffer under the greatest imputations that evil-minded men might suggest, rather than exculpate myself by explanation, and thereby run the hazards of closing this latest, the slightest avenue by which a brother in suffering might clear himself of the chains and fetters of slavery. The practice of publishing every new invention by which a slave is known to have escaped from slavery has neither wisdom nor necessity to sustain it. Had not Henry Box Brown and his friends attracted slaveholding attention to the manner of his escape, we might have had a thousand Box Browns per annum. The singularly original plan adopted by William and Ellen Crafts perished with the first using because every slaveholder in the land was apprised of it. The salt water slave who hung in the guards of a steamer, being washed the three days and three nights, like another Jonah, 
by the waves of the sea, as by the publicity given to the circumstance, set a spy on the guards of every steamer departing from southern ports. Life as a Freeman There is no necessity for any extended notice of the instance of this part of my life. There is nothing very striking or peculiar about my career as a freeman, when viewed apart from, from my life as a slave. The relation subsisting between my early experience and that which I am now about to narrate is perhaps my best apology for adding another chapter in this book. Dis disappearing from the kind reader in a flying cloud or balloon, pardon the figure, driven by the wind, and knowing not where I should land, whether in slavery or in freedom, it is proper that I should remove at once all anxiety by frankly making known where I alighted. The flight was a bold, imperious one, but here I am, in the great city of New York, safe and sound, without loss of blood or bone. In less than a week after leaving Baltimore, I was walking amid the hurrying throng and gazing upon the dazzling wonders of Broadway. The dreams of my childhood and the purposes of my manhood were now fulfilled. A free state around me and a free earth under my feet. What a moment was this to me. A whole year was pressed into a single day. A new world burst upon my agitated vision. I have often been asked by a kind friend to whom I have told my story. How I felt when first I found myself beyond the limits of slavery. And I must say here, as I have often said to them, there is scarcely anything about which I could not give a more satisfactory answer. It was a moment of joyous excitement which no words can describe. In a letter to a friend written soon after reaching New York, I said I felt as one might be supposed to feel on escaping from a den of hungry lions. But in a moment like that, sensations are too intense and too rapid for words. Anguish and grief, like darkness and rain, may be described but joy and gladness, like the rainbow of promise, defy alike the pen and pencil. For ten or fifteen years I had been dragging a heavy chain with a huge block attached to it, cumbering my every motion. I had felt myself doomed to drag this chain and, and this block through all life. All efforts before to separate myself from the hateful encumbrance had only seemed to rivet me the more firmly to it. Baffled and discouraged at times, I had asked myself the question, may not this, after all, be God's work? May he not, for wise ends, have doomed me to this lot? A contest had been going on in my mind for years, between the clear consciousness of right and the plausible errors of superstition, between the wisdom of manly courage and the foolish weakness of timidity. The contest was now ended. The chain was severed. God and right stood vindicated. I was a free man, and the voice of peace and joy thrilled my heart. Free and joyous, however, as I was, joy was not the only sensation I experienced. It was like the quick blaze, beautiful at the first, but which subsiding leaves the building charred and desolate. I was soon taught that I was still in an enemy's land. A sense of loneliness and insecurity oppressed me sadly. I had been but a few hours in New York, before I was met in the streets by a fugitive slave well known to me, and the information I got from him respecting New York did nothing to lessen my apprehension of danger. The fugitive in question was Allender's Jake in Baltimore, but said he, I am William Dixon in New York. I knew Jake well and knew when Tolly Allender and Mr. Price, for the latter employed Mr. Master Hugh as his foreman in his shipyard on Fells Point made an attempt to recapture Jake and failed. Jake told me all about his circumstances and how narrowly he escaped being taken back to slavery, that the city was now full of southerners, returning from the spring, that the black people in New York were not to be trusted, that there were hired men on the lookout for fugitives from slavery, and who for a few dollars would betray me into the hands of the slave catchers, that I must trust no man with my secret that I must not think of going either on the wharves to work or to a boarding house to board. And, worse still, this same Jake told me it was not in his power to help me. He seemed, even while cautioning me, to be fearing least, after all, I might be a party to a second attempt to recapture him. 
Under the inspiration of this thought, I must, I must suppose it was, he gave signs of a wish to get rid of me, and soon left me his whitewashed brush in hand, as he said, for his work, he was soon lost to sight among the throng, and I was alone again an easy prey to the kidnappers, if any should, should happen to be on my track. Right now, you might be struggling through your classes or even failing them. You might be worried that you may not finish high school. There might have even been a thought that you may not be smart enough. Well, the New Heights Educational Group begs to differ. We not only think you are smart enough, but with our help, you will complete your high school diploma. The New Heights Educational Group strives to improve your academic success through its tutoring services. To learn more, please visit newheightseducation.org and contact us. New Heights Educational Group educational resources to help reach your goals hello listeners if you're enjoying the new heights show on education and want to support or donate to our organization please visit www.newheightseducation.org and while you're there check out our online store Welcome back to the New Heights Show on Education. My name is Barbara Bullen and I'm the radio host for this show. This show is pre-recorded and focuses on the history of civil rights. A recap of the first segment of the show on Frederick Douglass will continue. Chapter 23, Introduced to the Abolitionists. In the summer of 1841, a grand anti-slavery convention was held in Nantucky under the auspices of Mr. Garrison and his friends. Until now, I had taken no holiday since my escape from slavery, having worked very hard that spring and summer in Richmond's brass foundry, sometimes working all night as well as all day, and needing a day or two of rest. I attended this convention, never supposing that I should take part in the proceedings. Indeed, I was not aware that anyone connected with the convention even so much as knew my name. I was, however, quite mistaken. Mr. William C. Coffin, a prominent abolitionist in those days of trial, had heard me speaking to my colored friends. In the little schoolhouse on 2nd Street, New Bedford, where we worshipped. He sought me out in the crowd and invited me to say a few words to the convention. Thus sought out and thus invited, I was induced to speak out the feelings inspired by the occasion and the fresh, rec and the fresh recollection of the scenes through which I had passed as a slave. My speech on this occasion is about the only one I ever made, of which I do not remember a single connected sentence. It was with the most it was with the utmost difficulty that I could stand erect or that I could command and articulate two words without hesitation and stammering. I trembled in every limb. I am not sure that my embarrassment was not the most effective part of my speech, if speech it could be called. At any rate, this is about the only part of my performance that, that I now distinctly remember. But excited and convulsed as I was, the audience, though remarkably quiet before, became as much excited as myself. Mr. Garrison followed me, taking me as his text, and now, whether I had made an eloquent speech in behalf of freedom or not, his was one never to be forgotten by those who heard it. Those who had heard Mr. Garrison oftenest and had known him longest were astonished. It was an effort of unequalled power, sweeping down like a very tornado, every opposing barrier, whether of sentiment or opinion. For a moment he possessed that almost fabulous inspiration often referred to, but seldom attained, in which a public meeting is transformed, as it were, into a single individuality, the orator welding a thousand heads and hearts at once, and by the simple majesty of his all-controlling thought, converting his hearers into the express image of his own soul. That night there were at least 1,000 Garrisonians in Nantucky, the close of this great meeting. I was duly awaited on by Mr. John A. Collins, then the general agent of the Massachusetts 
anti-slavery society and urgently solicited by him to become an agent of the society and to publicly advocate its anti-slavery principles. I was reluctant to take the proffered position. I had not been quiet three years from slavery, was honestly distrustful of my ability, wished to be excused, publicity exposed me to discovery and arrest by my master. And other objections came up, but Mr. Collins was not to be put off, and I finally consented to go out for three months, for I supposed that I should have got to the end of my story and my usefulness in the length of time. Here opened upon me a new life, a life for which I had no preparation. I was a graduate from the peculiar institution. Mr. Collins used to say when introducing me, with my diploma written on my back, the three years of my freedom had been spent in the hard school of, of adversity. My hands had been furnished by nature with something like a solid leather coating, and I had bravely marked out for myself a life of rough labor, suited to the, to the hardness of my hands as a means of supporting myself and rearing my children. Now what shall I say of this fourteen years' experience as a public advocate of the cause of my enslaved brothers and sisters? The time is but as a speck yet large enough to justify a pause for retrospection, and a pause it must only be. Young, ardent, and hopeful, I entered upon this new life in the full gush of unsuspecting enthusiasm. The cause was good, the men engaged in it were good, the means to attain its triumph good, heaven's blessings must attend all, and freedom must soon be given to the pining millions under a ruthless bondage. My whole heart went with the holy cause, and my most fervent prayer to the almighty disposer of the hearts of men were continually offered for his early triumph. Who or what, thought I, can withstand a cause so good, so holy, so indescribably glorious? The God of Israel is with us. The might of the eternal is on our side. Now let the, but the truth be spoken, and the nation will start forth at the sound. In this enthusiastic spirit, I dropped into the ranks of freedom's friends and went forth to battle. For a time, I was made to forget that my skin was dark and my hair crisped. For a time, I regretted that I could not have shared the hardships and dangers endured by the earlier workers for the slaves' release. I soon, however, found that my enthusiasm had been extravagant, that hardships and dangers were not yet past, and that the life now before me had shadows as well as sunbeams. Chapter 24 21 Months in Great Britain The allotments of providence, when coupled with trouble and anxiety, often conceal from finite vision the wisdom and goodness in which they are sent, and, frequently, what seemed a harsh and invidious dispensation is converted by after experience into a happy and beneficial arrangement. Thus, the painful liability to be turned again to slavery which haunted me by day and troubled my dreams by night, proved to be a necessary step in the path of knowledge and usefulness. The writing of my pamphlet in the spring of 1845 endangered my liberty and led me to seek a refuge from republican slavery in monarchical England. A rude, uncultivated fugitive slave was driven by stern necessity to that country to which young American gentlemen go to increase their stock of knowledge, to seek pleasure, to have their rough democratic manners softened by contact with English aristocratic refinement. On applying for a passage to England on board the Cambria of the Cunard Line, my friend James N. Buffum of Lynn, Massachusetts, was informed that I could not be received on board as a cabin passenger. American prejudice against color triumphed over British liberty and civilization and erected a color test and condition for crossing the sea in the cabin of a British vessel. The insult was keenly felt by my white friends, but to me it was common, expected and therefore a thing of no great consequence whether I went in the cabin or in the steerage. Moreover, I felt that if I could not go into the first cabin, first cabin passengers could come into the second cabin and the result justified my anticipations to the fullest extent. Indeed, I soon found myself an object of more general interest than I wished to be, 
and so far from being degraded by being placed in the second cabin, that part of the ship became the scene of as much pleasure and refinement during the voyage as its cabin itself. The Hutchinson family celebrated vocalists. Fellow passengers often came to my rude forecastle desk deck and sung their sweetest song, enlivening the place with eloquent music as well as spirited conversation during the voyage. In two days after leaving Boston, one part of the ship was about as free to me as another. My fellow passengers not only visited me, but invited me to visit them on the saloon deck. My visits there, however, were but seldom. I preferred to live within my privileges and keep upon my own premises. I found this quite as much in accordance with good policy as with my own feelings. The effect was that with the majority of the passengers, all color distinctions were flung to the winds, and I found myself treated with every mark of respect from the beginning to the end of the voyage, except in a single instance, and in that I came near being mobbed for complying with an invitation given me by the passengers and the captain of the Cambria to, to deliver a lecture on slavery. Our New Orleans and Georgia passengers were pleased to regard my lecture as an insult offered to them and swore I should not speak. They went so far as to threaten to throw me overboard, but for the firmness of Captain Judkins, probably would have, under the inspiration of slavery and brandy, attempted to put their threats into execution. I have no space to describe the scene, although its tragic and comic peculiarities are well worth describing. An end was put to the melee by the captains calling the ship's company to put the salt water mopocrats in irons, as this determined order. The gentlemen of the lash scampered and for the rest of the voyage conducted themselves very decorously. This incident of the voyage in two days after landing at Liverpool brought me at once before the British public, and that by no act of my own. The gentlemen so promptly snubbed in their meditated violence flew to the press to justify their conduct and to denounce me as a worthless and insolent negro. This course was even less wise than the conduct it was intended to sustain, for, besides awakening something like a national interest in me and securing me an audience, it brought out counter-statements and threw the blame upon themselves which they had sought to fasten upon me and the gallant captain of the ship. Some notion may be formed of the difference in my feelings and circumstances while abroad, from the following extract from one of a series of letters addressed to me by to Mr. Garrison and published in the Liberator, it was written on the first day of January, 1846. My dear friend Garrison, up to this time I have given no direct expression of the views, feelings, and opinions which I have formed respecting the character and condition of the people of this land. I have refrained thus purposely. I wish to speak advisedly, and in order to do this I have waited till, I trust, experience has brought my opinion to an intelligent maturity. I have been thus careful, not because I think what I say will have much effect in shaping the opinions of the world, but because whatever of influence I may possess, whether little or much, I wish it to go in the right direction, and according to truth, I hardly need say that in speaking of Ireland, I shall be influenced by no prejudices in favor of America. I think my circumstances all forbid that I have no end to serve, no creed to uphold, no government to defend, and as to nation I belong to none. I have no protection at home or resting place abroad. The land of my birth welcomes me to her shores only as a slave and spurns with contempt the, the idea of treating me differently so that I am an outcast from the society of my childhood and an, and an outlaw in the land of my birth. I am a stranger with thee and a sojourner as all my fathers were. That men should be patriotic is to me perfectly natural and as a philosophical, philosophical fact. I am able to give it an intellectual recognition, but no further can I go. If ever I had any patriotism, or any capacity for the feeling, it was whipped out of me long since by the lash of the American soul drivers. In thinking of America, I sometimes find myself admiring her bright blue sky, her grand old woods, her fertile lands, 
her beautiful rivers, her mighty lakes and star-crowned mountains. But my raptures soon checked, my joy soon turned to mourning, when I remember that all is cursed with the infernal spirit of slaveholding, robbery and wrong. When I remember that with the waters of our noblest rivers, the tears of my brethren are born to the ocean, disregarded and forgotten, and that her most fertile fields, fields drink daily of the warm blood of my outraged sisters. I am filled with utterable loathing, and led to reproach myself that anything could fall from my lips in praise of such a land. America will not allow her children to love her. She seems bent on compelling those who would be her warmest friends to be her worst enemies. May God give her repentance before it is too late, is the ardent prayer of my heart. I will continue to pray, labor, and wait, believing that she cannot always be insensible to the dictates of justice or death or deaf to the voice of humanity. This comes to the conclusion of the show. Next week's show will continue on the autobiography of Frederick Douglass, My Bondage and My Freedom. Thank you for listening. You can reach me by email, barbara b at newheightseducation.org. Be sure to join me every Sunday at radio.newheightseducation.org, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, as I discuss the history of civil rights. Also join Pamela Clark's pre-recorded shows, which is Wednesday by 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Civil rights is our right. Have a great week. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Don't forget to rate us and follow us on your podcast player. Check out our show page, radio.newheightseducation.org, for monthly announcements and other happenings.